This revision video covers the parts of the waves topic that you only need to know about if you're taking GCSE physics or triple science. The parts of this topic that are also in combined science have their own separate video, so if you are taking the triple science exams, you need both of them. Since 40% of the marks in the GCSE science exams are for recalling key facts from the specification, this is an opportunity to check that you've thoroughly learned them. Download the worksheet from the description below, quiz yourself, and then use this video to check your answers. Sound waves travel through solids by causing the particles to vibrate. Because the particles are closer together in a solid than in a liquid or a gas, sounds are able to travel faster through solids. When a sound wave reaches your ear, it causes the eardrum to vibrate. Only a limited range of frequencies of sound wave are able to be converted into vibration, and so that's why there's a limit to the different frequencies that you're able to hear. The normal range of human hearing is something like 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, or you might hear it called 20 kilohertz. As you get older, it's normal for those higher frequencies to be lost. Ultrasound is the name that we give to sound waves that have a higher frequency than can be heard by human ears. When ultrasound meets a boundary between two different media, it's partially reflected, and this allows it to be used for imaging because that reflected sound wave can be detected, and the length of time between when it was emitted and when it was detected allows us to work out how far away the boundary between those two media was. This is routinely used during neonatal imaging, so when you're taking an image of an unborn baby because using x-rays would be dangerous because it could cause mutation of the DNA, but also in industrial imaging where you're looking for cracks in pipes and also in deep sea imaging, so where you've got a boat moving through unfamiliar terrain and they're using this ultrasound imaging in order to work out how far away the sea floor is. Seismic waves are waves that are produced during an earthquake. And whereas P waves are longitudinal and they have different speeds in solids and in liquids, S waves are transverse and they cannot travel through a liquid. Lenses form images by refracting light. In other words, causing those parallel rays of light to rapidly change direction and to meet in a central point, which we call the focus. A convex lens has sides which bulge outwards, and this can be shown as a double headed arrow whereas a concave lens has sides which bulge inwards. So you can think of this as being a bit like going into a cave. And the symbol for this is basically an arrow that's had the heads reversed. The principal focus is the point where parallel rays of light will converge when they're refracted together. And the distance between that principal focus and the actual lens is what we call the focal length. Real images can be projected onto a piece of paper, whereas a virtual image is something that you sort of think you can see, but because it isn't real, you can't actually project it onto anything. For a convex lens, you need to be able to draw ray diagrams that show both how to make a real image, which can be projected onto a piece of paper, and also a virtual image, which can't be. And the difference between these two diagrams is going to be where the object is to start with. So to begin with, we need a central axis, and onto that central axis, you put a double-headed arrow, which is our lens, our convex lens. We need to show where the principal focus is, and the distance between that principal focus and the lens, which is the focal length, is important because you don't just have a principal focus in front of the lens, you also have one behind, and that needs to be the same distance away. You need to be consistent in your scale. And particularly for this first diagram, it's only going to work when we have the object more than two focal lengths away from that lens. So again, I'm going to measure another focal length and that point is called 2F. And here is my image. Now from this image, we're going to draw two different rays of light. The first one is a parallel ray of light. And I should have arrows to show the direction. And that is going to be focused through the focal point or through the principal focus. So I draw a line that looks like this and it goes straight through that. And then my second ray of light, which is going to be the same regardless of the type of lens I'm using, is going to go right through the centre where that lens meets the central axis. Now, where those two points have crossed, where they've focused, that's where my object is going to be. So there I'm going to draw that point and then I'm going to add in my object. And that is my real image. 
My second convex lens diagram starts off quite similarly. So again, I have my central axis and I have my convex lens, which is represented by the double headed arrow. But the difference this time is going to be where the object is to begin with. So again, I can add in my principal focus and my focal length. And this time my object is going to come inside that focal length. So it's nearer to the lens than one focal length away. I'm going to draw the same two rays. So initially I have my parallel ray and this is going to go through the principal focus. And again, I should have arrows on that to indicate where it's going. Um, and then my second ray of light is just going to go straight through that central axis um, where it meets the lens. Now, as you can see there, those two rays of light are not converging. They're not focusing. They're actually diverging. And so we're not going to have a real image being produced. Instead, we're going to track back from those two rays of light. So this is usually shown with dotted lines. And I'm going to track back until again they meet, again they focus and cross over each other. And this is where my image is going to form. And this, of course, is a virtual image. It doesn't really exist. It can't be projected onto a piece of paper. For this ray diagram, I start out drawing the central axis just as I did before. But this time, when I add my symbol for the lens, the heads of the arrow have been reversed in order to show that this is a concave lens rather than a convex lens. I still indicate where my principal focus is. And here's my object. Now, again, I'm going to draw two rays of light. The first one, as it did before, is going to come straight through where the lens meets that central axis. And then the second one, again, is going to run parallel to that central axis until it meets the lens. And it's still going to be refracted through the principal focus. But this time, it's not going to be the one on the opposite side of the lens. It's going to be this one here. So what actually happens is that the ray of light is refracted upwards like that. And you can sort of imagine that virtual ray going back through that principal focus there. And it's that virtual ray that crosses with the other ray of light here. And so that is where we draw our image. And so as you can see, with that concave lens, we've got this much smaller image being produced. The equation to calculate magnification is image is actual multiplied by magnification. So I suppose we could rearrange that to make it magnification is the size of the image divided by the actual size of the object that you're looking at. The reason that I prefer it in this formula is because it allows me to do a triangle. And this is pretty much the only place in the whole of GCSE science where I will tell you to use a triangle, because generally I think it's just one more thing to remember. But I am is a nice sentence. I think that just makes sense to me. So it's quite easy to remember that one. Specular reflection is what happens when light hits a flat surface like a plane mirror. And so because it's smooth, all of the light is reflected in a single direction. So this is our kind of classic law of reflection idea where the light comes in at one angle and it leaves at the same angle and all of that light leaves together. Whereas diffuse reflection is what happens when that light hits a rough surface and is scattered. Light is different colours because of the different wavelengths. So if you have a very long wavelength, like about 700 nanometers, that light will appear red, whereas a short wavelength of maybe 400 nanometers will appear blue. When you look at objects through a red filter, anything that is red will appear red, obviously, and anything that has any red in it. So anything that is purple or anything that is yellow will also appear red. Remember that your primary and secondary colours for light are not the same as your ones for paint. So yellow is actually a secondary colour made by red and green light mixing together. But if you have an object that is purely green or purely blue, so it doesn't have any red light reflecting off it, then it will appear black. So the reason for this is that when you look through a red filter, only red light can pass through. So if you have, say, a purple object, that purple object is reflecting red light and blue light, but only the red light can get through the filter and therefore it will appear red. But if we actually had an object that was entirely blue and it wasn't reflecting any red light in the first place, then that red light wouldn't make through, but nor would the blue light. And therefore that object would just appear to be black because it would appear as if it wasn't reflecting any light at all. As we've just touched on, the colour of an opaque object is determined by which wavelengths of light it is reflecting. If an object reflects all the wavelengths equally, then it will appear white. And if it reflects none of them, it will appear black. 
transparent objects transmit all of the light that goes onto them. So in other words, all light is able to pass through that object, whereas a translucent object is only going to transmit some of it. The hotter that an object is, the more infrared radiation it will be radiating. A perfect black body is something that absorbs all of the radiation that is instant on it. In other words, all of the radiation that touches it. So none of it is being reflected and none of it is being transmitted. It's all just being absorbed. If an object is at a constant temperature, this tells us that the infrared radiation that's being absorbed and the infrared radiation that's being emitted must be equal to one another. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this video useful. Don't forget to also check out the other video for the combined science parts of the course, which do come up in the GCSE physics exams as well. If you have found this useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE physics videos coming soon.